started. Go ahead. Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth edition of Alpine's Greatest Hits monthly webinar. This month, we've got the Beatles theme come together. We're with Monet Global and Tom Zozo Associates, aka TZA and ProTrack, to talk about using labor standards to propel a culture of high performance and positive people. This is our fifth and I will have to share our legal disclaimer that the information discussed in this session represents the views and individuals, does not constitute um, any advice should you consult with your organization's leadership and legal counsel. So without further ado, let's meet our presenters. Number one, we've got John Seidel, Director of Partnerships and Alliances with TZA Labor Management. Number two, we've got Alfredo, Global Warehouse Operations with Monet, Monet Global. And then number three, we've got Gonzalo, who has been our right-hand man with the business service process and development at Monet Global. Thank you all for taking the time this afternoon to join us and share your story with our live audience today. Speaking of live audiences today, please note that we have the chat and the QA and if you guys want to submit questions throughout the process, we will be going ahead and watching those and answering them on demand. So without further ado, our agenda today is number one, who is Monet Global? Number two, let's make sure we're all on the same page with the topic overview. And then number three, let's talk about the approach we took. One of our fundamentals is a crawl, walk, run approach. And we did that here at Monet. And then the last but not forgotten, is lessons learned. So if we had the opportunity to do this again, what would we do different and why? So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Alfredo. Alfredo, tell us a little bit about Monet Global. Monet, uh, good afternoon. Monet is a direct selling company. It's a fairly new company. It, it was established in 2014. Um, and we've been very successful growing, uh, developing. We actually uh, specialize in uh, hair care. We specialize in uh, skin care and we specialize in wellness. Um, we've been focusing on just gaining efficiency and producing a better product to our customers and uh, Alpine and the team have done a great job just supporting us. How, how many independent agents do you guys have today? I believe Mike was about 1.5 million right now. Wow, that's great. 1.5 million salespeople on the street, a website where you can place orders, and then the product gets shipped direct to home. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when I met Alfredo and Gonzalo um, back in early 2020, um, it was pretty interesting to see uh, the way that their operation was running. They were running you know, two 10 hour shifts a day, five to six days a week, trying to keep up with demand. And labor and performance management is the topic for today. So when you think about variable labor, it's typically the largest cost bucket within your P&L. And the question is, how do you ensure you're maximizing your variable labor investment? The answer to that is labor and performance management. So you know, I walked into their environment and they were doing everything they could to get as much volume out. And that was in 2020. So everybody knows exactly what happened later that year and the predecessor 21 and 22. And here we are 23, finally at the, at the fourth corner of our journey. Um, what's interesting is if you think about the approach we took, uh, we, we started with a crawl to get through that first holiday season in 2020. Then we walked in 2021, and then we're running in 2023 and 2024. So we're gonna talk about the approach we took in these three buckets. The very first bucket was the crawl. So we walked in, there had to be you know, 400, 500 people on the floor. And of that, a majority of them were actually temp labor resources. You had five to six people making boxes. You had five to six people doing shrink wrap, five to six people doing the kits. You had, you know, five to six people per 12 lines for picking. 
and you had packers and manifestors and, and everybody was everywhere and they had different color shirts. So if you were a Monad employee, you had a certain color shirt. If you were a temp employee, you had a certain color shirt. So the first thing we did is we performed a best practice assessment of their labor planning process and identified a few pressures. Number one, labor. Increased volume had resulted in contract labor to the total workforce ratio, which was higher, which also increased overtime and expenditures. Number two, the pressure is workforce planning tools. So there wasn't a planning tool that said, how many people do we know on this day, this week, this month? Given your direct sales force and given the end of the month, we saw some volumes that went up and down, as well as when you guys do your annual uh, promotions and big conferences, uh, the Genesis and, and those types of things. There's a lot of kits that have to be built before those. Um, and then the third was the temporary strategy. So contract employees to total workforce was over 300%. Industry typical average is less than 10%. Some shifts, the third shift, had very limited Monat um, representation. And then temps were not being converted in the full time um, or released as soon as possible, posing a co-employment risk. So what we did is we worked with the entire team to look at and start with a very simple Excel labor planning tool that allowed us to handle weekly labor in short term. Then we looked at a little bit larger with the releases and the kits and the production to get a long-term staffing, uh, staffing strategy to help the volume goals. So thinking about that, Gonzalo, Alfredo, anything that you want to add about that, you know, kind of crawl phase to get us through that 2020 holiday season? I, I, for, I mean, Mike, we had a lot of great points. To us, the, the key was just understanding what the actual process was. We, we thought we were comfortable with what we were doing, and then we kind of realized that we were just lucky in our day to day. Uh, we really didn't have strong processes, and we really um, were struggling to get the orders out. But just the crawl effect was just actually learning what we were actually doing, what we needed to do to move forward. Yeah, and I got to tell you, I mean, just the fact that we were able to get in there, I think we reduced the overall temp labor by 15 to 20 percent, just got through the holiday season knew what we needed on a daily basis. So we didn't have to send people home and we maximized the team and we were building kits on the fly to make up for the additional resources. But, you know, that was when we were hitting between seven and 9,000 orders a day and then trying to augment with the kits, not to mention the international. So you guys kept adding additional countries. When we started, I think you only were in maybe seven countries and then you added two more and then two more. So as your global expansion, it also took a, a, a drastic toll on the labor. Okay, so we got the crawl, we got the little labor planning, we made some things, we also made some physical changes to the building to help get the volumes through. The second part was the walk. So now we're really talking about process improvement, standardization, and engagement. So when you think about the process improvement, this is Gonzalo's area. So Gonzalo, um, you wanna talk a little bit about that process improvement, the standardization? Yes, uh, <clears throat> sorry, automation, automation itself uh, improved processes a lot, but there were a lot of systems, new systems and new processes uh, in this highly automated facility. We, we try to uh, support our, one of our workers uh, through training and through uh, work instructions and SOPs in order for them to be uh, aware of the new changes in the process. Uh, then we start analyzing uh, different requirements, uh, the resources that we need. And uh, you know, most, most of the people here speak Spanish. Then was a challenge also to translate many of these uh, documents and SOPs to, to Spanish and to train them, to train them properly in different areas. But actually, um, was a very good. We are going to talk later, but we have improved our inventory accuracy. We have improved our efficiency and 
the, the throughput and output in general of our process. It's interesting is when we walked into the building the very first time, you had case flow, right? And it was all paper-based and there was no automation. And so to be able to go into that environment, develop the best practice and really understand it was pretty easy. But then what we did is we installed SAP EWM. And when we started doing the cartonization, pick the light, pick it into the box and those types of things, we leverage the whole acceptance test criteria as the foundation to do the training for all these new resources. And then once we had that training and we had that standardization of process, you guys had to go through to get the ISO certification. How long did that take? Uh, it took uh, several months of preparation. Uh, the auditor, actually, we have an initial certification in the old building. And but then the real certification was in this big new building. And the auditor of uh, ISO 9001 was very, very impressed that everything was documented, our records uh, in our system and SIT uh, were uh, properly registered, all transactions, uh, all the training was complete. And then uh, we comply with all the requirements of the ISO 9001 certification and we were certified last year. Fantastic. Okay, so now we got the process improvement. We went from a manual environment, picking full pallets and cases for international, picking direct to consumer eaches. We leveraged the SAP EWM. We got ISO certified. And then how specifically were you guys able to um, you know, get that team rallied around it. So Alfredo, you guys took some unconventional approaches to invest in your employees. And, and, and really when labor was a scarce and a, a, a very difficult commodity, what were you guys doing to, to bring the team in and to invest in them? Uh, we, we did quite a few things. Uh, I, I know one of the things that we were doing was actually in one period of time, since we were so busy, everybody was learning and trying to understand the system. Everybody was getting like lunch for free and we created a couple of, uh, you know, occasional delight factors. You know, we did a lot of recognition. Um, and we actually, before anybody stepped into the new building, uh, we actually certified everybody in the new building and actually created uh, almost like a graduation type of format just thanking everybody and recognizing, and recognizing everybody for what they did. Um, you know, our biggest thing or biggest success throughout all this here has been the engagement and communication and, and the training that we did up front. So we want to make sure the associates were completely engaged, understood. Um, you know, that change management aspect is very important, but we constantly did occasional delight factors and we, I, I think it was like every day straight for like four months before lunch for everybody and just kind of, you know, gave out a little thank you every time we got a chance. And then what about like um, some unconventional things like going back to school, helping them oh. get, you know, better education, get their we, degrees. I mean, that was pretty cool. Yeah, Mike, I, Michael, I forgot about that. Um, you know, one of the things that we believe in here is developing our associates from within and preparing them for future roles. So what we always do is try to support their learning. You know, we, we believe in having a culture of learning. So if our associates want to go back to school, we actually pay for their education. Um, each associate is able to go back uh, to school, university, and we, we reimburse them. I think it's close to $6,000 a year. Uh, even if they want to get a certificate in supply chain, uh, which we've had plenty of our associates do, we'll reimburse them for that. Uh, it's just creating that culture of learning. We want to make sure that, you know, our success that we experience at the company is just not felt by the company, but also by the associates. So the more they learn and the more we support them through education and development is going to help us in the long run. It's unbelievable. Um, I think the, the the vernacular I heard from one of your associates, Gimel, was, you know, invest in them like you want them to leave, but treat them 
so well that they they'll, they'll stay. So um, I know that this is a you know a silver lining at Monat and how you guys are really investing in your team and your people and your you know I love the promote from within. I mean some of the associates when I first met them you know they were on the floor and now they're supervisors and managers and directors. So you know I've seen personal and professional growth with inside the organization and and you guys do a great job on that. Gonzalo, you had asked us to put kind of this uh, fulfillment steps together. Is there anything you wanted to share about this uh, process flow document here? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to show you that uh, the new process, the fulfillment process required the interaction among different systems. So, uh, the SIP ERP, the SIP EWM, then the KVK uh, system, uh, uh, the system from the data tractor is the, the, the system to receive our, the orders, and many other systems that they have to, to talk among themselves and interact. And these are the processes uh, of the new automated process. As you see, there is only one, one gray area there that is only manual, is this when the packers have to fill the, you know, the PT paper into the into the boxes. But everything else is automated. And in here is the describe all the processes in detail, the, how the the labels are printed, the uh, print and apply, the scanners, all the process in the conveyor, and everything that is fully automated. I wanted to, to present this. And this was a challenge because there was for the associates and for our, all our workers, we have to train them and explain these new systems and how they have to to, to manage and, and operate these processes. Yeah, so the SAP EWM, and uh, for those people that don't know KVK or COS, it's a WCS, Warehouse Control System. We want the math used pick the light, and then the one manual thing is just a, a, a dunnage paper uh, into the top of the, the box. So this actually uh, really helps us understand. And everybody asks, hey, installing a WMS today is so easy. Well, it's not easy, especially if you go with an automated facility. So um, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but this facility does up to 50,000 orders, 42 cartons a minute in a 10 hour shift. So, you know, this is speed to value at its, at its fullest. So, um, Excellent. Okay, so now we've got the walk, right? So crawl, we got a lot of labor. We got put in some short-term, long-term planning, document the process. Walk, we're going to leverage the SAP EWM. We're going to go ahead and standardize. We're going to get SOPs, end user training. We're going to get everything together, get the ISO certification. Now the run. So John, you know, ProTrack has been around for a while. It's probably number one, best of breed, standalone labor management solution. Talk to us a little bit about the approach and then, you know, kind of, we can talk a little bit about the benefits of it. Sure. Thank you, Michael. You know, I, as you said, TZA has been around since 1984. So we've been at this for a very long time. Um, but I think without saying it, you guys have already identified the difference between when these programs succeed and when they struggle. And that's the, your crawl, walk, run approach. The fact that Monette has embraced, you know, building a model of employee engagement and uh, performance-based culture and thought about the physical facility design, thought about the process design, and are putting all of that in place, you know, as a prerequisite to deploying the tool, that's going to make the difference between an easy win and what would be a little bit of a struggle, right? A labor management system by itself, really good at what it does, both in terms of planning labor and managing that labor and rewarding performance and measuring performance. You know, as a tool, they're very robust, right? ProTrack will, you know, execute against the labor engineered labor standards that can be designed uh, by the customer by Alpine and allow you to measure the performance of each of your associates, the teams for both direct and indirect labor relative to those standards and even allow you to create you know, incentives ultimately to share that value with those associates that are contributing. But none of it'll work as well as you want it to unless you build that culture first. So, uh, you know, to us, 
you know, we're pleased, very much pleased to be part of the team and have, you know, working with this program. But why this is going to be a success is because of what we've heard about before. And certainly the tool will enable the day-to-day -day execution of the program, but it's enabled by the culture and the processes that have been put in place. Fantastic. And now, um, you know, Alfredo, thinking about putting in the labor management system, you've got the culture, you've got the change manager, you've got the process. Are you and your team excited about this? Are the people on the floor nervous about this? Or do you think that everybody understands the benefit of this? No, the, the, the team really understands it and it, they're very excited uh, with this system. Um, you know, the key component of this, Michael, how, how we sold it was the sheer fact about the, the rewards they will see, right? We, we want to make sure that we're going to capture a lot of savings on efficiency, but we're also creating that key component that we're going to, the incentive plan that we're going to create for the associates. So once they hit a certain percent after their 100% efficiency, they're going to earn extra money. And they're, they're able to see, they love to see the numbers. They love to compete. And they, they love to be the best. So they, they're challenging each other. Uh, but for us, you know, it gives us the opportunity to recognize the associates. Uh, it does give us the opportunity to address some performance issues when, it, when they come up. Um, and, and realistically, when we've had performance issues, the associates just do a great job of understanding and retaining, and, and we have to retrain and redo. Uh, the idea with the accountability component is not to get rid of any associates, it's just to you know, support them and, and address the issue. Um, and in the long run, uh, we should be rolling out the incentive plan here, hopefully later this year or in the beginning of 2024. That's our goal. That's great. So we're even doing a crawl walk run within the regards to the ProTrack LMS install. Um, but you said it the best, right? So you can't manage what you don't measure. And so we went and had to re-engineer to figure out, hey, we are at 81 lines per hour per picker. And now, right, we're 250, 260 lines per hour per picker. So now we want to establish a, a baseline for all the roles, all the processes, all the capabilities, and then start to manage that, make sure we got a good solid foundation and then incentivize it. So um, that's, a, that's a huge part of it. So um, we got a question that came in. Uh, what are the key features that you see have changed within the performance tracking process with the addition of the new automation technology? So. So this question goes to you, John. So back in the day, it was, you know, case pick, the palette, this and that. Now we're starting to see goods the person, BLMs, pick the light, automation. How, is, how has that changed the performance tracking process, if at all? Sure. So I'm going to give a slightly broader answer than just the context of this particular project with Monette. But, you know, traditionally, the LMS got a feed from the warehouse management system and the time and attendance system. Uh, in today's more highly automated, especially the robotics-driven facilities where we're working, we're getting a feed from the warehouse execution system so that we can track some of the indirect labor where the humans are interacting with the robots and track the productivity of how the humans are engaged by the robots and how, pro and how promptly the robots are processing the workflow that's been given to them. So the, the nature of the integration has expanded to include the warehouse execution system so that we can capture the performance, both of the automation itself, as well as the human automation integration. And then we pull all of that into our BI tool and can report back you know, a slightly different team structure when there's automation involved in order to show the direct and indirect activities of the humans that are working with that automation. That's a great question, and I, I really liked it because I didn't know the answer to it, right? So, I mean, back in 1993, I was doing industrial engineered standards with a data writer and going out there and checking the elements and creating the standard. But now with automation and robots, you know, how has that process changed? So that was, that was great. And for all of you uh, listening out there, uh, we've got chat and QA. So if you have a question, please feel free to submit it, and we'll do our best to answer it um, real time, just like that one. Yeah, and okay. Michael, you... You, yeah. Real quick, I would also suggest that we still use 
engineered, you know, observation-based engineered standards, even in an automated environment, that trying to use historic data or uh, performance information in order to calculate standards without observation, we're finding is not effective even in an automated environment where we know the throughput of the automation itself. So that human touch of the engineer as well as the managers to help guide the development of those standards is still critical. Thank you, John. That's a good point. Um, and, and I know bringing this all back home, we, we've got another customer, they've got an auto store, they got four four level pick module, they got put walls, you know, and we had to go out and, you know, we created standards on each of the small elements and then you put it all together, but it's, it's, it's really a, a little bit interesting now getting the feeds out of the WMS into the LMS for an individual and then cross training. So the first half of the day, somebody might be replenishing the auto store. The back half of the day, they might be picking out of the auto store or they might actually be packing orders. So being able to have the, the ability to sign into a specific task have a metric for that task and, and those types of things. Okay, so John, labor and performance management, maybe give us a little idea. I know you already talked about creating the culture and, and Monat, you know, hats off to them. They, they've, they've got that in our DNA and, and we've gone on it. So let's, let's go forward with kind of these three buckets here. So, yeah, I think, and, and Alfredo touched on it, right? The, Today's warehouse associates, especially the younger generation of warehouse associates, they are, I don't know, inherently more competitive perhaps than, than prior generations and are motivated by the gamification of the LMS, right? Creating not only that culture of performance, but then measuring and sharing the results of that performance. You know, for example, ProTrack has these production boards where you can, you know, mount monitors in the break rooms or lunch rooms or on the floor of the facility and you can display information on the top performers of the day or this team versus that team and how they're performing and it's remarkable the impact it has on productivity when you not only capture measure and manage the individual or team performance but then when you gamify it and create this kind of competitive spirit as part of that performance-based culture wow Right. I mean, that's when, you know, I know you cited numbers that were going from 80 to hundreds. I mean, that's the sort of outcome we see. People are very proud of the fact that their team was the gold level performer versus the silver level performer. And I agree, they very much enjoy the gain share and the financial reward associated with high performance. But you know what? They also like earning that badge and reaching that next level and having their team recognized at the picnic and, you know, all of that sort of thing as well. So when we talk about changing your culture, it's not just about the simple financial reward of the incentive program, although that is the backbone of the entire thing, but that recognition element that Monet has already talked about, you know, that they've implemented in the earlier stages of this program, expanding that recognition, sharing that and making a big deal about it. And they will even be able to do things like when someone earns that certificate certificate of education in supply chain or complete some course, you know, they can put that information onto the production board and be proud of what their associates are accomplishing, whether it has anything to do with the actual day-to-day -day operations, right? We can recognize birthdays and new babies and, you know, that communication employee engagement element is almost as important as the engineering underneath. I, I've personally seen where you get into an environment like that and it gets competitive and the entire team rises, not just a couple of key individuals, the entire team rises. And you know what? The competitiveness is really good. Um, bragging rights have a lot to do with it in the break rooms for sure. Um, but you know, after a week or a month and you get the recognition, employee of the month, employee of the week or whatever, and they get to go home to their family and, and, and share with them, hey, I leave you for 40, 50, 60 hours a week and I go do this and look at how I was rewarded for it. So that's a huge part of the culture. Um, you know, Alfredo, Gonzalo, anything you want to add to this, uh, you know, labor and performance management portion? 
from your perspective? I mean, j just tagging in a little bit on, on John is, I, I, I think our biggest success, yeah, the numbers are great, Michael. Um, for me, the success has been the engagement of the associates. You know, we, we've changed a lot of things when we started cross-training everybody. Uh, we're still working on creating that 100% flexible workforce. But one of the things that we do right off the bat is make sure that everybody understands the whys. Why are we doing it? We want the associates to be engaged. We're not going to shy away from them asking questions. Um, you know, going back to that whole lean mentality, you know, we start our shift when we start selecting waters before we have a pre-shift meeting and nothing big just 15 minutes and we share what's going to happen in the day we take any questions um we want to make sure everybody understands the whys and i think that's been part of our success they're very competitive we have a very unique workforce they love to be number one but to me every single day when i walk out here in gonzalo as well you know we always ask certain leading questions you know, hey, how is it going? What are you guys doing? What do you think? How's today going to turn out? Um, I mean, it's just simple things, but we want to make sure that the associates engage and they realize that we support them and we care for them. It's just not about they're doing 150 lines per hour. We want to know that they're doing okay, and that's part of that culture that we're creating. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so culture takes some time, right? I mean, in 2020, we were crawling 20 orders per man hour. 84% of the orders were processed the next day. So that's a lack of not having a real-time warehouse management system, not understanding how we can keep up with growth, just throwing bodies at it, trying to figure it out. The walk in 2022, right? We, we, we fixed the holiday season within the existing building. We got into the new building. Um, it wasn't easy. I mean, obviously, uh, you want to talk about, you know, overcoming obstacles. Number one, we couldn't get a permit of occupancy. It just so happened to be in Dade County where that unfortunate circumstance happened and that condominium, uh, unfortunately, came down. Well, those inspectors look at warehouses and they look at condominium buildings. So I know there was a lot of people that Unfortunately, lost their job during that time, and we were waiting anxiously with unbridled anticipation to get an inspector out to get into the building. Once we did, though, then we were cooking with gas. Um, you know, we we got the you know combi cart directors up and running. We got the 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 slug line ten mirrored pick the light lines. We had the spiral up three pack stations, four spirals down. And we got to a point where we were able to do, you know, 50,000 orders in a 10 hour period, 42 cartons a minute. And we built the business case, right? Under promise and over deliver on 120 lines per hour. And we had brand new associates that had never picked an order at Bonap. And they were hitting 250, 260. Some of the more veterans were hitting 290, almost 300 lines per hour. So the system was built with a KISS mentality, keep it super simple, so that way we can plug and play resources and then we can cross train as the volumes go up and down based on the areas of the business. And then the run, you know, we had talked about where we're even crawl walk running the labor management piece, let's get it up and running, let's establish the baseline and then let's put the incentives in. So, you know, this takes some time. It's 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 a uh, it's not you know a, a six to eight week project, and you're not going to do one or two rah rah speeches. You got to have the leadership, and I know you know Alfredo, you have really invested in your team. I can see it when you walk the floor. Gamel, yourself, Matt. I mean, um, just just a great great environment. So let's think about lessons learned. So you know um, you know nothing comes easy. Obviously, we talked about the challenges with the certification of occupancy, but you know, any key lessons learned, Alfredo, from your perspective going through um, this process? Uh, you know, I guess I was thinking about this. The, the key for me was, was actually the learning aspect of it. Uh, we started speaking with the associates back in 2020, just showing them with the building. Remember, Michael, when we had that first design, this is what we're going to look like. And we started speaking about the building. Um, you know, my lesson learned was maybe we should have 
offered a little more training up front. Um, but realistically, you know, that, that's just playing, you know, Monday quarterback. We really don't know if that would have had an effect or not. But the key for me was just speaking about the building, sharing with them or the associates what the dream was going to be and how we're going to look like in the future. But maybe just focus a little more on the training. Maybe that's my only negative. Uh, my lesson Interesting. learned from the very beginning is just strictly how successful the team has been. It's interesting. I mean, organizational change management, awareness, project leap, new building, like we gave everybody all the communication. But I remember like during the training, you're like, oh, we, we probably should have trained more. During the training, I asked them, are you guys happy to be in this new building? No. Why? It's slow. Because we were only like releasing 100 orders. 500 orders we're doing all this acceptance testing making sure the conveyors and the verts and everything and they wanted to be in the other building not air conditioned and just work and work and work in because they were you know kind of start stop start stop trying to get the the testing and the boxes and everything working so it's interesting you know it it uh, that that was yours gonzalo right so we went from a manual process to an automated process the iso certification from you, what was what was the big lesson learned? And if you could do something different, what would you do? Yes, I think one of the main lessons that uh, our managers and supervisors have to change their mindset, you know, uh, because now they they need to make decisions, constantly make decisions, uh, be ready for troubleshooting and solving any situations in this. Uh, even so, the system is full automated. It needs a uh, more analysis, uh, more communication, uh, more soft skills, besides the technical skills that are needed. Then I think that uh, one of the main lessons was that, fortunately, we are doing that, and they are, uh, fortunately, they are grow, and they know how to uh, proceed now in all the areas in the warehouse. So the manager's mindset, ability to change with the data and the analysis that's performed. Um, it's it's interesting, you know. You you guys did a great job on the OCM, let them know it's coming. Um, and and we just had this on another project that like we we went in, we did the design, we did the acceptance testing, we went live, and then just the fact that what my job is going to look like from the old building, manual this and that, and the process to the new, right? So I got these reports in the WMS, I've got these reports on the LM, I've got this labor planning. And and so we told the associates on the floor how their job's going to change, but we really didn't do a good job of letting that manager, like you know, Alfredo, you're good, right? I got my numbers, I know how my labor planning's going, but the 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 between the associate and yourself, their their job changed too. So Gonzalo, great pull. Yeah. All right, John, lesson learned. You know, obviously, uh, ProTrack, all the customers, all the installs. You know, in a in a an environment like this, the crawl walk run approach. Any lessons learned or things that you would suggest? You know, companies do different. <laughs> yeah, I think you want to uh, clone uh, Gonzalo and Alfredo and bring that level level of leadership support to all of your programs. I think, you know, the when I look at customers that have not had the same level of success, there's common challenges that we see. Most of them are related to either a lack of embracing the new strategy by, at the supervisor level or turnover at the executive leadership level that the original sponsor for the program has left the organization and whoever has been brought in to replace them hasn't necessarily been along for the journey and struggles to embrace it with the same level of efficiency. So I think, you know, really making sure that you know, from your hourly associates to your supervisors to your managers to up through your senior supply chain executives, that everyone is aligned and bought into the program and willing to make that investment in the people. That's the difference, right? I mean, I you can use the same ProTrack LMS tool and get different levels of results. And the difference isn't the tool, it's the same tool, right? The difference is the investment that the customer is willing to make in their people to embrace you know, the change, embrace the new processes, embrace that new culture, and then allow the tool to enable that and hold yourselves accountable to actually leveraging the information in the tool, both 
from the day to day leadership of the people level, but up through the BI tool, understand the data that you're being fed, look at the performance, not only inside that facility, but across all the facilities in your network, learn those lessons, leverage those best practices, and then you'll get the outcomes like we've been talking about today. I love it, the leadership support. All right, just to remind everybody, we've got the Q&A in the chat. So feel free to submit a question and we'll get the answer. I got one here. It says, um, I don't know if this is for uh, Gonzalo or Alfredo, but um, do you feel now that you've got the defined jobs and training processes in place, is it easier to bring in new resources? Is it harder? We, we, we do have everything defined. We have all the SOPs. Every single functional area has a, an SOP attached, attached to it. Um, in the past, um, we were maybe two weeks training an associate uh, to come into the door, just training him, just getting him to fill an order correctly. It would take about two weeks. Right now, uh, with the system that we have, a day, maybe eight hours when they'll start at nine o'clock in the morning and by four o'clock they're pretty proficient in what they're doing that's how simple the system is the system is very user friendly uh and all the functional areas that we have whether it's fulfillment or assembly or uh inbound uh outbound it's all documented in, and the system is very user friendly it's made our life very very easy nice John, this question's for you. How often would you review the labor management or measurement, I'm sorry, labor man measurement and elements to ensure that they are fair and reasonable? So once you establish that, you know, quote unquote, metric of success out there and you're going to incentivize on it, how often do you want to review it and make sure it's still fair and reasonable? Yeah, it's the pool of, you know, everything is user defined, right? Both, both the standards themselves, the multivariant standards, you know, are, um, you know, built by through observation, and there is going to be a need to refine them over time, right, both in terms of whether or not the nature of the work changes, the characteristics of an order changes, you add additional automation to the facility, you know, for whatever reason, your KPIs evolve over time, and the standards will need to evolve with them. So, I think there's an ongoing responsibility to look at how the associates are performing relative to the standards. We use a zero-based uh, performance measurement. In other words, if you're operating at the zero level, you're right on standard. Greater than zero means you're exceeding the expectations. Less than zero means you're falling a little bit short. And you know, we incorporate things like a learning curve so that temporary associates or new associates are not being held to the same standard as someone who's been in a role for several years. So you, know, you don't need to worry about the difference in the learning curve. We can even incorporate fatigue factors and things so that the standards later in the shift are different than they are earlier in the shift. But in any sort of environment, whether it's union, non-union, et cetera, there needs to be a perception on the part of the associates and an accurate perception that the standards are fair. And especially when you're talking about an incentive-based pay program like we are at Monette, where you're doing a gain share, that employee and that associate needs to feel like they actually have the possibility to share in that wealth, in that contribution that they're, that they're making and the value they're creating for the organization. So making sure that everyone is bought into the standards and that you openly, if you see a standard that needs to be adjusted based on whether or not it's too loose or too strong, uh, you know, that, that should be an ongoing role. And you will learn as a supervisor of an area and you're looking at your team's performance and then the individuals within those teams. If there's a standard that's not right, you'll notice it very quickly. And if you're talking so, about changing a process or introducing automation as part of that program, you should be adjusting those standards. Okay. So obviously it's ongoing, but you definitely need to be measuring it. As soon as it gets out of tolerance, go and look at it, redo it. So it could be monthly, could be quarterly, could be seasonally. But if you have the right metrics in place, as soon as your associates are starting to get out of that, then something's changed, right? 
Right. And you've got to, I mean, this is, again, it's got to be effective communications and it's going to be different based on the environment and whether or not it's a union facility or not, et cetera. Sure. But you, if you do this wrong, right, as soon as your employees, you know, start to succeed and perform at a different level, if you then raise the bar, you'll disincentivize them, right? I mean, they'll feel, oh, Understood. wait, you know, you're not being fair, or you're not being equitable. So it's a function of, you know, communication and buy-in throughout the organization in order to make those adjustments and maintain that perception that they're fair and appropriate. Fantastic. Alfredo, I got a question for you. Uh, do you include the temporary staff in the labor incentives? Have you guys decided to do that? We, ha we have not. Um, that's still up for debate. Um, the idea is, I, I really don't want to have a large number of associates or temporaries. I mean, I, I would like to have everybody come on board and become part of Monade. But that, that's okay. still up for discussion. So. Okay, what about you, John? Have you guys seen temps getting incentives? Um, because of the learning curve expectation, we tend to have, mo most of our customers tend to have a time and grade requirement before they're eligible for the incentive program in order to allow them to become comfortable in that role. Now it's become interesting in the market is people migrate from the traditional temp agency world to um, an on-demand labor pool, more of a gig-based temp model where the, uh, the temporary associates are pre-qualified and pre-certified in various roles and responsibilities, then those people that have been through that kind of a program are, uh, tend to be eligible for the incentives sooner, you know, okay. immediately. And, and the other way I've seen it too is um, in a uh, similar environment, one of uh, independent sales agents, their first week of the month is 70% of their month volume. And then way to incentivize them, they actually have temporary employees, but they just work one week a month and they were on incentive. So I guess in the environment that you're in, some temp employees might qualify, some might not. Um, I got one more question here. How would you incentivize teams such as inventory where they're just problem solving? So I don't know, John or Alfredo, which one of you want to take that one? Go ahead, Alfredo. You can go first. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about the question because I actually have never, I've never done it. I've never given the sense of inventory control. They're a completely different pay scale in our world, uh, and they are they, they are problem solvers. Um, what we're thinking about doing. And we haven't spoken about this, Michael, is creating with like an old, uh, an operational incentive plan, depending on our total uh, results that we have in, in a quarter. So we make our numbers, you know, our efficiency targets, our, um, if, if we are in the black in our departments, then we're thinking about creating an OIP, which is an operational incentive plan for everybody. But an individual measure for inventory control or cycle count, I haven't thought about that yet. Yeah, so it's interesting is normally um, I get that they're out there and they're, they're troubleshooting, but what, what that role is normally, like if somebody goes to a location, they're not able to fulfill their demand, they hit skip. It means that somebody overpicked or, um, you know, something's gone. So you get there, you set it. The replenishment happens. Now you go check all the orders, right, that have that item and you get it before it goes out the door. Who was the picker? Who overpicked? So now you've improved customer satisfaction. You haven't overshipped. You reconcile inventory. Like that role has way more uh, value than uh, a normal associate on the floor. So they're usually, you know, um, quote unquote, you know, administrators or senior or directors or something like that, that has the ability to adjust the inventory. But more importantly, if they do track it down, they find the order, then going back as part of that incentive, now there's a ding, right? There's a negative against picker one, two, three, right? Because the quality wasn't there and that actually impacts their incentives. Well, guess what? Nobody likes that inventory person anymore. Because they're 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 finding their problems, right? So it is a it's a tough role in, in how to incentivize them. 
Um, just real quickly, I know that we're getting to the top of the hour. Thank you all for all your questions and, and details. Please note that uh, we usually do one uh, webinar a month. It just so happens that this month um, we're going to have two. So um, we have a, a, an event with Peerless, um, the year of efficiency. Why now is the time to upgrade your WMS profitability and customer experience? So Raymore and Flanagan has 22 sites and they're upgrading their best of breed warehouse management system. Um, on the call, myself, um, Kerber Supply Chain's Rick Schrader, and then the Supply Chain Management Review, uh, Brian Strait. So we're going to have a, a conversation on May 25th. And then not to be um, outdone, the last one for the summer, June 8th, is uh, the uh, WMS TMS Buyer's Guide. And again, we're keeping with the greatest hits and those themes. So first and foremost, John, Gonzalo, Alfredo, thank you so much for investing the time today. Thank you for sharing your story about your journey, the crawl, walk, and run for labor and performance management. Um, we really appreciate it. And for those of you uh, that gave us your time today, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you in a future monthly webinar. Everybody have a wonderful day and uh, take care. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.